Okay, so, well, everybody is here and we're happy to have Alba today. Alba is going to tell us about, about the record status and the length in by spec. Thank you. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm a <clears throat> final year PhD student in the University of Groningen with uh, my supervisor, Dan Mielburg. But I'm currently at CCA, Potari Institute, as a pre-doctoral fellow. I'm there till uh, end of January, so if you happen to come by, uh, I'm very happy to uh, um, meet you um, chat. Um, and uh, today I'm, I'm very happy to tell you about a work that we have been doing. Uh, it's based on this paper that came out recently uh, on the um, uh, CMB length by suspension reconstructed uh, from CMB. Um, does it work? And so the focus will be mainly on the challenges that we have um, encountered in measuring the lensing by spectrum and in particular the noise biases, the reconstruction noise biases. Uh, first, I will give a brief introduction on weak lensing, uh, even if I feel like here people don't really need that, <laughs> that much, so I'll be fast on that. And then I will uh, explain why we go beyond the Gaussian assumption. And uh, I will show you how we reconstruct lensing from CMB and isotropies. And, um, and how we do this with uh, uh, Feynman diagrams. Um, and I will also share with you some results and uh, validation of simulations and give conclusion in future directions. Um, so let me start from introduction. Well, uh, the photons of the CMB that travel through the homogeneities of matter uh, when they uh, come to our detectors are deflected by distribution of matter. And um, the CMB and isotropies are distorted as you probably cannot really see from here because the effect is really small and from a level of arcaneness across several degrees. And um, and so if you see this picture moving, it's all right. It's the effect of lensing that is distorting the CMB and isotropies, in this case, the uh, um, temperature and isotropies. Uh, effectively, what happens is that the anisotropies are remapped by a deflection angle that I highlighted here, which is given as a gradient of the so-called lensing potential which is uh, uh, described as the integrated uh, across the line of sight um, uh, gravitational potential, where here chi is the commoving uh, distance and psi is the gravitational potential. Um, and as such, the Lancy potential traces the matter distribution across uh, uh, um, large values of redshift from recombination up to now, making it a very important and powerful prop of the growth of large structure across several uh, redshifts, uh, but also of physics that might suppress cosmic growth, such as uh, neutrinos, so we can probe the um, uh, sum of neutrino masses with lensing, uh, and in particular, try to determine the neutrino mass hierarchy. But we can also uh, probe dark, dark energy models, especially at uh, uh, lower redshifts. And um, effectively, just to give an idea of uh, what this means, uh, given that the distortion angle is a uh, deflection angle, it's really small. We can um, uh, we can expand this expression in uh, um, in uh, various uh, gradients of phi. As you can see, where here the tilde means as if we are considering the lens mode, while the t without the tilde is the unlensed one, and so we have additional terms here that depend on the gradient of the length and, uh, of the temperature mode and the gradient of the lensing potential. And we can go on with this expansion. Um, this means that effectively what lensing does is um, induce a secondary type of non-Gaussianity in the CMB primary anisotropies. Because now if you, for example, take the four-point correlation function of the length temperature mode in the unlensed case is a four-point correlation function would be Zero, but in this case, it's proportional to the um, lensing potential of power spectrum, for example. Uh, but um, an important fact is that we can actually reconstruct the lensing potential from the lens uh, CMB anisotropies. Uh, and this has been done assuming that the, the signal is Gaussian. Uh, the lensing power spectrum has been measured uh, by Planck data, most like many, actually, several CMB experiments. But most recently by uh, uh, Planck uh, through polar temperature and polarization data, and they have provided a detection that's a uh, very high statistical uh, significance. Uh, and the signal itself has been used to uh, constrain cosmology, of course, 
And uh, I'm just showing here like how including uh, the lensing power spectrum to the uh, primary PMB power spectra actually improves uh, constraints. And you can see it from here. This is a, a, a plot from, this is the posterior distribution from uh, plant collaboration on um, matter density and sigma eight, uh, the uh, amplitude of the matter power spectrum at eight mega megaparsecs. Um, uh, and now, but it, while the assumption, Gaussian assumption was a good uh, approximation for uh, experiments like Planck, in the future, we actually want to look at the non-Gaussian uh, signals, so at the next order uh, statistic, which is the bispectrum. Uh, and this is induced by late time non-linear uh, non clustering that induces a non-zero matter bispectrum and in turn induces a non-zero bispectrum of a lengthy potential phi. And in particular, in uh, uh, this paper here from Toshiba and Amikawa in 2016, he showed that uh, the cumulative signal to noise ratio of the bispectrum for certain types of experiments, he considered a uh, stage three wide and deep experiments and stage four uh, types of experiments. The um, cumulative signal to noise is pretty high, especially for stage four. Here, one note is that these papers from 2016, so maybe you might see that uh, the stage four uh, uh, parameters are a bit different because uh, I think like in 2016, they were thinking uh, <laughs> they were different than they changed it. <laughs> and the noise levels, I think, right? Mm -hmm. so I think stage four is still aiming at one mic. Yeah, exactly, one yeah. Uh, but the point is that the lengthy by spectrum might be and will actually will be detected by uh, next generation ground based CMB experiments. Um, but uh, most importantly, one other thing, uh, one outstanding finding of this paper is that when you combine the power spectrum and the bi spectrum uh, of uh, phi, then you get an improvement on constraint that goes up to 35% with respect to using the power spectrum alone. This is for stage four types of experiments, but we can also assume that the, there's going to be an improvement also for uh, stage three. Um, but especially for, for example, CMBS4. The X axis here is the L of the CMB. Or is the yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so this makes the lens of spectrum a very appealing observable, especially for next generation experiments, something to look at uh, in the future. But you're right that even if, I mean, I would say that right now, for example, our like stage three noise isn't that good, but nonetheless, like it's probably good enough that. Yeah, you get more than five from the yeah. noise, like you get it. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the two lines here are different. It's just the the noise has been uh, very constructed with two different methods, solid iterative and uh, a dash is with a quadratic estimator. But uh, apart from that, yeah, these two methods should pass these two. Uh, well, if you have other questions, please just, yeah, just, uh, I'm very happy to uh, hear from you. <laughs> um, and so with this, uh, you know, this idea in mind, we're, re we're really motivating to looking into actually reconstructing the bispectrum from CMB. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, like a very efficient and optimal, somehow somewhat optimal way of doing this is to uh, use a quadratic estimator that is quadratic in the uh, temperature and isotropies. Here, I'm just limiting uh, to temperature and polarization because that's what we did in our analysis, but we plan in the future to add polarization as well. This is the uh, famous Wakamoto estimator in flat sky, where you can see that uh, indeed uh, you have, oh, sorry, you have uh, two temperature, dense temperature and uh, And then if you want to take the uh, bi spectrum, so three, oh, sorry, <laughs> okay, this is a filter function uh, uh, to make the uh, estimator uh, optimal and the normalization that makes it unbiased. And so if you want to look at the bi spectrum, so a three point correlation function, we take three copies of phi, then what we have here is a six point correlation function of the lens temperature modes, which is what we need to solve. Um, and you have, of course, like normalization, filter functions, and a bunch of integrals. But then if you do this perturbatively in phi, so you take the expansion in phi that I showed earlier, then what you would get is the signal that you were looking for, but you also get a bunch of uh, additional terms that are the scope noise biases because they add noise and uh, they can actual, uh, actually also bias the signal. Um, where the uh, superscript here uh, gives you the order 
in the length in power spectrum. And so, for example, N0 is the, well, it doesn't really depend on, it's just the Gaussian fluctuations that come from the estimator. And one depends on the uh, length in power spectrum linearly. Uh, N2 depends on it quadratically. And then we have N3 halves, which is the noise bias that contains the bias spectrum itself. We should be called the bias, just <laughs> apart from noise. Um, but uh, one message that before I go into the details, so I'm going to spoil a bit the, the, the rest of the talk. I'm just giving you like the final result somehow. Uh, what I want to show you is that the, uh, these noise bias really dominate over the signal. And so without going into details of this right now, I'm showing you two different uh, splicing configurations of the bias spectrum, equilateral unfolded. And uh, you see the uh, black and gray lines are the signal um, computed with two different theoretical models. And uh, here I'm showing also the two largest noise biases, N0 and N1. And you can see that the, they really bury the signal. And so it's really important for us to look at these noise biases and to quantify them if we want to actually retrieve the signal. And uh, this is going to be, oh yeah, I want to give a, a quick recap before going to the actual details of the calculations of the noise biases. So as I said, uh, upcoming CMB experiments will be sensitive to the bias spectrum less potential. And uh, this signal is very interesting because it can help us to um, improve the constraints on late-time cosmology, especially when it's combined to the uh, with the uh, lensing power spectrum. Yeah. I, was thinking, I was thinking about a question to ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the point is that uh, the signal is buried in reconstruction noise, even if we assume the phi is Gaussian, uh, because as I was showing here, these are the two largest noise biases. They actually don't depend, do not depend on the bias spectrum of phi. They depend on the power spectrum. So they are there even if we assume that they're uh, the phi. Can we go back to this uh, three half term in, and I didn't understand. So, um, yeah, I don't understand why is there is such a term. It depends on what? The on the uh, lensing bias spectrum. So on the yeah, it depends on the signal itself. It contains the signal. Oh, and why wouldn't it? Why, why is this is not part of the signal? Uh, I think it, it. I mean, it can be included, but it's not part of the signal because it's a bias to the signal. It's similar to what happens to when you reconstruct the power spectrum. You have that uh, uh, one of the noise biases contains the power spectrum itself, but it's not included in the signal. You have to actually remove it. And you have to carefully remove it to avoid to remove also the signal as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hmm. If I were so this function, this phi L, you essentially you try to get the potential of the temperature. But I assume that in the relation is really linear, you will have higher order term, which you can write. Um higher order in T that the relates um to obtain phi L from the temperature. So this is like a, a, the lowest order thing that you can write. The, is the quadratic right? estimator? No, so, it's, uh, so it's, no, it shouldn't be. It. I, mm. Okay, but maybe, 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 okay. I would, I just, I would just ask you maybe later. I mean, I mean the yeah. relation is all, the relation between T lens and TM lens is linear. In, it's not linear in gravity the potential. So the more, because it's oh, T yeah. of phi, uh, theta. Yeah, yeah. So the T there is only always, in each term there's only one. But there's more grad fives, and then which I guess are coming in into your head. Exactly. This is what the yeah, question you know, was. Exactly. That, those, those are those and one. But so if you were to keep, yeah. if you were to keep those in the formula above, would you remove automatically the S or no? Um, mm. I mean, you, it must. I think. It, I think this is maybe what is what this iterative thing is. Like. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. You still have to take them into account, though. Okay, this my, my question was exactly that if you were to keep them, I would imagine that you would remove order by order those terms. Maybe I'm. Um, all right, so, well, in the next part of the talk, I will just show you how we compute these noise biases. Uh, we, so, well, of course, like a traditional way to do this is with uh, weak contractions of uh, correlation functions um, among the uh, relevant fields. Um, we did that as well, but we also wanted to um, kind of explore this more 
a fast method to do that, which employs Feynman diagrams. Uh, there's no particle physics involved. It's just the formalism that really fits very well the problem here. The In particular, I will show you later the details, but uh, diagrams might look like this, where you have a, a three times a two-point correlation function, but you can have also oh, sorry, more complex diagrams, like, for example, this one, where you visually can see that it has a four-point times two-point correlation function, and this is a connected six-point correlation function. But uh, don't worry, I will show you a bit like the details, especially on this, uh, let's say the simplest one. Mm -hmm. So you can see like step by step how it works and later gen generalize a little bit. Um, well, we were using this approach because when you have a six point correlation function, uh, the uh, calculation can be more significantly more challenging, uh, especially when you take uh, higher orders implying the expansion. Um, but so this is a way of getting to the integral that you need to do fast. Yeah, the integral yeah, yeah. is the same. Yes, yes, of course. But then like instead of computing all the yeah. terms, you just write down your yeah. diagrams. Yeah, but the integral has to be the same, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so let me just show you some basic rules. We have the a building block uh, given where you have the two vertexes that correspond to the uh, uh, temperature and exotropies. Here the vertices are the um, circles. And uh, these effectively correspond to the normalization and the filtering function. And then similarly to what you have in uh, particle physics, you also introduce some propagators where a straight line gives you the uh, uh, CMD uh, angular power spectrum temperature. And the weakened line is the um, power spectrum of the lengthy potential. And a rule to keep in mind is that at each vertex you have momentum conservation. And so if we want to uh, compute a three-point correlation function, then we'll have three building blocks with two vertices each. So it corresponds to a six-point correlation function of the temperature modes, uh, each with the momenta. Then uh, let's say we want to explore the lowest order. So we have unbalanced uh, temperature. So it's, this is the zeroth order in this function. Uh, then you only have straight lines because that's the unbalanced temperature uh, power spectrum. Uh, then you have momentum conservation, so you can rewrite some of your momenta in terms of others, and so you find out that actually, uh, apart from the, um, actually, you can rewrite everything in terms of L1, basically. Um, here, just uh, to keep everyone on the same page, uh, capital L is the momenta of the reconstructed uh, lens potential, and the small l's are the temperature, a CMB temperature momenta. And then, uh, you already, by basically looking at this uh, diagram, you can already write down an expression. You have your filter functions, you have the normalization uh, with the momenta that come from momentum conservation. Then you can write down the three propagators of the temperature. And then another a beautiful feature of this method is that you can see the symmetries already without having to compute all of them, because you can show that inside each building block, there's a symmetry by exchange of uh, of uh, propagators. And so it, it's very straightforward to show that this is actually the only independent uh, diagram uh, with a factor of eight in front of it. And so it's just a few steps and then you get your <laughs> noise bias that you want. Um, this is for N0. It's also the simplest one to compute. You can do this also with weak expansion. But then if you go to higher orders, then this becomes in increasingly more challenging, especially to keep track of all the permutations. And so having the symmetry is already evident that diagrammatically is very important. And um, also another nice feature of this is that you can actually see the connected components uh, from the diagrams. Uh, they, here I highlighted uh, three uh, connected components that correspond to the two-point correlation function. Because if you uh, cut through one of these uh, boxes, you will cut the propagator. And so, I don't know if this is clear. <laughs> so while if I cut through, for example, this line, I don't cut the propagator. And so this corresponds to a connected part of the, um, of the diagram. Then you can move forward with uh, your expansion. And for example, add a weakened line, which means that you add a power of uh, phi. And then you have diagrams of this sort, 
where you can again see the connected parts, where here you have a four point correlation function because you cannot cut through any of these lines without cutting the propagator. And then here you have a two point correlation function. And this in particular corresponds without showing you all the details of calculation, but corresponds to M1 that is indeed proportional to the uh, power spectrum of the lensing potential. So there you have a weekly line. And then you can go on with your expansion, add another weekly line, and then this is the bispectrum. And it's a connected six point function that gives you, for example, M3 halves. Um, so and so. What are the rules here? Uh, so the, you can. There are the weekly lines come come with vertices. Everybody has to join the dot. Yeah, how how do I? I mean, why do why do I draw the lines like that? Is there some rules? Yeah, of course there's. Yeah, yeah. But so, for example, for the I don't know. Oh, no, I don't have it. Uh, so here, for example, uh, if you add another weekly line that connects to vertices, then you'll have something that is proportional to. Uh, the square of the uh, Lancy potential, for example. But for example, there is no uh, connection between a wiggly line and a straight line that is not in. Uh, like yeah, in the next thing, you, 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 you had wiggly yeah. line, vertex of wiggly line. But mm -hmm. you don't have vertex of wiggly line. And well, because that would correspond to the um, power spectrum of T and phi, which we are not ignoring in this case. We're neglecting mm -hmm. those terms. Yeah. And we're also neglecting primordial but longestianity, so we don't have a similar uh, similar uh, propagator for the temperature that will correspond to the primordial by spectrum. What is the small parameter that you use to ignore this correlation? Hmm? What's the small parameter that you use to ignore this correlation? Oh uh, no, it's just that the, for example, the correlation between temperature and uh, length potential is rather small with respect to. Just because they have a different yeah. range. Mm -hmm. It's rather small with respect to, for example, the mm, temperature power spectrum and the uh, uh, length of potential power spectrum. So it's not. Because it. the integration would be when you draw the process. Yeah, the lensing happens in the mm -hmm. it's so far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can safely ignore those frames. The primordial <laughs> alpha now would, could have a straight line coming off one of the other straight lines up to. Yeah, you can have. Uh, yeah, it was in here, I think, but uh, you can also have like. Yes, similar to this, but with straight lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but we decided to ignore this. Okay. And um, and yes, so you can basically by adding with the lines, you go on into expansion on phi, and so you do this. You can, I mean, you can go on as far as you want, <laughs> but we stopped at and two. <laughs> so the the solid lines are always the same. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, apart from some permutation that they need exactly so this method so here we consider only temperature but definitely it will be interesting to see this when we add polarization as well because first of all there will be some other symmetries there to keep in mind also parity and so uh i i think i truly believe that this method will, will definitely help with that as well um well i hope i kind of gave you an idea what this looks like um and uh now i would like to go on to the actually to the uh, results that we have and uh, validation with simulations because uh we computed in particular um n0 n1 and n3 halves uh but then we focused on zero and n1 because they're the largest noise biases and so we then uh simulated them to see whether we were getting um to check consistency of our theoretical results and so um, how do we sim simulate N0? That's rather simple because, as I said, this comes from basically, uh, mm, I mean, N0 arises even in the absence of lensing, comes from the estimator itself. Um, and so, but here we're interested in lensing, of course. So what we can do is to draw a Gaussian realization from a, a lens uh, temperature um, power spectrum. And then we use the a full sky, sorry, a Gaussian realization. Then we use the quadratic estimator here to reconstruct phi. Uh, and then what we do is using a bin by spectrum to compute the by spectrum. In this case, since we just changed basically the variance of the simulation, we didn't introduce effectively introduce lensing in it, so no length for spectrum. If we compute the bin by spectrum, we only get n zero because we also draw a Gaussian realization of it. 
And uh, we consider, as I kind of mentioned earlier, two types of configurations, equilateral and folded, that are basically, uh, you get them from, by um, implementing this relation between the momentum. So can, can I, we go back a second? Because yeah. now I'm confused by something. This zero, this counts the, so for example, um, even if phi was Gaussian, there could be terms that are higher order the power spectrum of phi, right? Yes, yes, yes. I don't know, two power spectrum of phi. So those are called what? Something that has two power spectrum of phi, even if phi is Gaussian. So you mean in terms of uh, non spicy? Yeah, would you call them N2? N2, N2, yeah. And so why does this not also have N2 in it? Uh, because there's actually, there's, you're not actually introducing uh, lensing in your map. It's just that basically. Oh, you didn't. Yeah. You didn't. No, I just didn't took a fiducial, ray trace. Uh, yeah, exactly. Ah, okay. I just took a fiducial lens power spectrum, drew drew a Gaussian realization from it, and did the analysis. And so the only term that appears at is n zero because it comes from Gaussian fluctuation J. And so that's why I said it's pretty easy to simulate n zero in this case. Um, and uh, this is uh, like a result we get for the two um, configurations that I showed you. Um, it's pretty good at high L's here in this part here, but you can already see that the folded configuration uh, has a mismatch at low L's. And uh, we uh, think that this is due to binning because, of course, you, binning is very useful because, uh, you know, uh, it's time consuming to get the bisection. And so binning obviously helps. Here we have 60 bin, uh, but indeed you can see the effect there. And also let me add that the uh, folded uh, noise bias in this case is negative. Um, and uh, also, then we also uh, check that. And you're doing flat sky, right? Yeah, so you it's have- folding, could it be that one of the L's is coming too low or something compared to the flat sky approximation now? It might be. So we see some uh, full flat sky mismatch in a lateral one. It's a high else, uh, but it's not really evident in the um, in the folded one. So we, I was, I mean, uh, I tested binning. So I added some bins, and this is what you get when you go from, for example, 60 to 100, you already get a better uh, match with the simulation. So it definitely has a binning component. It might be that also the uh, full flat sky uh, mismatch might be also there. But you can really see here from like 20 bins, the circles to the diamonds that are the 100 bins, like the improvement is pretty, pretty, pretty big. And also, let me just add that they noticed this in this paper here where they were assessing the beam by spectrum with simulation and the analytical um, expressions, where they already see that uh, the folded configuration is affected by it. Um, there's um, a few reasons for this. Uh, first of all, the signals that we are kind of probing here are very small. And so uh, whatever sample variance you have, it's going to be very big. And um, uh, if you bin, if your bin is too wide, then you're going to get some uh, fluctuation from that. And uh, also, as I said, we're basically imposing this relationship when you uh, use the bin by spectrum. And so it might be that... Uh, some configuration that still respects that uh, relation can enter. And so if the bin is too wide, you might have a lot of uh, best fashion configuration that enter there. And so your average then is not the right one. Um, but it's also nice to see that if you add bins, then you get a better result as well. Um, so then we do the same for N1. Uh, in this case, we actually have to get a draw of Gaussian realization from unlensed the temperature power spectrum and an, a Gaussian realization from the um, lensy potential power spectrum and then lens it with uh, lens the CMB map with it to get uh, the uh, lens CMB map basically. And then you reconstruct and then by using the, bi the beam by spectrum, you get again N0, but you also get N1 and N2 specifically. But N2 can actually be mitigated by using this method, non perturbability I won't go into details of it, but you can actually remove N2, which is pretty nice. Um, and then 
the thing that's left to do is basically uh, if you want to simulate M1, you have to remove them M0. And there are different ways of doing this. Um, given our slight mismatch with uh, full sky simulations and flat sky uh, uh, analytical results, and also this beaming effect, we try this other method where we basically, from each uh, lens uh, CMB map, we reconstruct again the by spectrum as we did for N0. And this is the way to get basically the actual N0 of the map. So we do a sort of a simulation based subtraction of N0. Um, and this kind of works pretty well. We get a pretty good result for the folded configuration. Uh, the equilateral one is a bit more tricky. As you can see, the analytical result has these oscillating features, especially at high Ls, which are very difficult for the simulations to capture, even if we, we have uh, 10,000 simulations here. So it's kind of a high number, but these features tell you also the error bars are larger as well. So they tell you that probably we either need more simulations or again, that the, we need to improve the beam, basically. Um, all right, so uh, unless you have other questions, I'd like to go to the conclusions. Um, so, well, as I said, like, CMB lensing allows us to constrain link time cosmology and a very interesting uh, signal for the uh, next generation CMB experiments is the bispectral lensing potential. Uh, and we are able to theoretically model uh, some of the noise biases that uh, vary basically the signal. And uh, we do this consistently with simulations. There is a lot of work ahead. So we would like, as I mentioned, to add polarization data and also kind of exploit the parity between E and B to have less noise biases in the reconstruction. Um, then we would like to perform a similar analysis that I showed you for N0 and N1 for N3 halves because this contains the signal, so it will be critical to actually model it perfectly. Um, then we would like to do realization dependent analysis in view of data. This uh, type of analysis mixes simulations and data to remove the noise biases. And it's more robust to uh, systematics. Uh, then finally, of course, we'd like to uh, detect the bispectrum, hopefully. <laughs> we were talking about Simon's Observatory, but then we are talking with Joe, maybe with ACT as well. Uh, we would like to, of course, detect it. That's why we're doing all this work. Um, and also, thank you very much. Here are some other things I work on, and uh, I'm leaving it here. I will be, as I said, at Plagarin uh, for a, a few, few months more. Uh, so I'll be around, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. If you have any other questions, um, yeah. Yes, uh, something uh, you didn't mention was about uh, when one abandons the quadratic estimator and tries to do the iterative thing. Mm -hmm. when, yeah. when was this, uh, the, uh, there, there was some noise level that you had to achieve in order for it to make sense? Or are we far away from that, you know? Or, uh, I mean, for the assignment. Or... I'm not sure. I think it was like for the regular lensing, I think it was like S4 kind of noise level, but iterative. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure. <laughs> Can I ask about the, the signal? So let's say you've dealt with all the noise biases, just going back to your plot where you showed the signal. Ah, this, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, how, um, yeah. I'm just wondering about how well we are able to compute that. The signal, well, this would, this would depend really on models. Yeah, yeah or the matter by spectrum. And so where do, do we get them from? Sims or from um as analytics? Yeah, what, from Sims mostly. Yeah, as far as I know, there's what people do is basically try to fit uh, simulations. So these two mm -hmm. uh, papers that I mentioned here do yeah. that. Yeah. Also here I didn't add was born corrections, but they're yeah. quite important. Mm -hmm in the folded configuration because they are negative and so you will have some negative values in the bispectrum. One thing that I really find interesting about the folded uh, configuration is that the noise biases are negative over all the of the um, L values, but the signal is positive oh. most on almost <laughs> L values. And so I think it's very interesting. I mean, of course, we need to remove carefully all of these noise biases, 
But in particular, in this slice in here, I think it's very interesting because it's a good consistency check. If you remove non spikes, but you have still have some mm, negative values where you supposed to have positive ones, then it means that you haven't done this properly. So it's kind of a nice thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it will definitely depend a lot on uh, much by special modeling. Yeah. What are these oscillations that uh, uh, we got there? These are, from, yeah, I'm from uh, Scucci model heating oh. formula. Yeah, I'm not sure where they come from. <laughs> so they have to do with the B or no? Not I don't think so. It's, it's kind of strange, right? Because it's this projected thing over such a mm -hmm. long, Yeah. Why would you have? Typically, yeah, where maybe the CMD power effect. Mm. But this is not, this has nothing, this is not, yeah, it has nothing to do with the same. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's also very, very Imagine. strong, right? It's like 10% mm. of the yeah. like BO is 5%. Yeah. And when you project, you lose even more. So, you know, actually, is it the one of Kuchimaru or Gilmarie in this? Yeah, the black one. Yeah, yeah. The black one is Kuchimaru. And, and the, with the, with the, uh -huh. features. yeah. And would I was wasn't quite paying attention that would would you imagine just doing you could imagine doing all sorts of triangles, but you this example for these two shapes. Um do you think that's how the analysis would proceed that you would pick two shapes like yeah. that? Or would you try and do some something? Yeah, like uh I was discussing this with Sushia. He said that uh these are the shapes that contribute the most to the uh to the signal to noise. Okay, yeah, especially the folded. One thing about the squeeze shape is that uh, they showed in uh, the paper that I mentioned when I was talking about beaming that it's really affected by beaming a lot. Um, they're not sure but why. Uh, again, it might be that the size of beam is too large. Um, and so that was one of the other reasons we decided to exclude it from the analysis. We might maybe in the future do some simulations maybe like fewer and then use a higher number of beams to check it. Okay, so and there are other questions, but in case we're all here to the <laughs> uh, I think we can we can thank Albert for a nice talk.